Hey everyone, welcome to the Evangelist Nick Garrett channel. Please subscribe so you don't miss any of the action. Today, the Christian Crusaders enter Syria and lay siege to Antioch. The Armenian ruler of Edessa, Tauros, ends up assassinated and Baldwin becomes Count of Edessa. And then, a bird gets word to Damascus that the leader in Antioch needs help. Then, the Christians learn what it means to suffer for Christ as Crusaders. Be right back. The Crusaders finally entered Syria in mid to late 1097 AD and began laying siege to Antioch. It was no small feat as the city was considered impregnable. Antioch had no less than 400 towers along its walls, and in part topography made her perimeter easy to defend and hard to penetrate. With mountains on several sides and small water crossings as well as hillsides to further complicate siege planning. The city of Antioch was a melting pot of Christians, Greeks, Turks, and Armenians under Arab rule. The later Arab chronicler Ibn al athir documented how worried the Turkish ruler Yagi Siyan became at the news the Crusaders had made such steady progress toward him. It's hard not to believe that he had at least heard of the fate of Kili Arslan and his forces as well. One morning, even as the crusader camp was in view, Yagi Sien made the Christian men leave the city just outside Antioch's walls to dig a defensive trench around the city. At night, after digging all day, when they attempted to re-enter the city, Sien blocked their return, saying, quote, you can leave me Antioch until I see how things will be with us and the Franks, end quote. By October 1097, the bulk of the Crusader army had arrived outside Antioch. While they arranged their forces predominantly on the northwest corner because a high forested mountain prevented surrounding most of the city, they fashioned pontoons across the small waterways so they could run sorties against the walls. By mid-November, cold was setting in and food became sparse. Bohemond and Robert of Flanders went on a foraging expedition to gather whatever might be left to eat. While foraging, they came into contact with a large Turkish force sent from Damascus to relieve Antioch. The Damascenes had ironically been contacted using what was considered an old technology, homing birds to pass messages between forces. Word had obviously gotten through. Although it was Bohemond and Robert that barely escaped, the Turks actually retreated and were therefore unable to provide any benefit to the city of Antioch. There was little hope at that point that they would make any further progress in Antioch that year, especially after the battle with the Damascenes. The winter closed with a freezing, starving army outside the city walls of Antioch. During 1098, things didn't seem to be improving. Desertions became common and were dealt with harshly. Among the desertions was the leader of the People's Crusade himself, Peter the Hermit. Bohemond of Taranto, however, made exceptions and showed great mercy to him considering how others had been treated. Titikios and the whole Greek contingent, sent by Alexios himself from Constantinople to fight alongside the Latin crusaders, packed up and left the siege, insisting they only intended to retrieve supplies but would return. Meanwhile, east in Edessa, Baldwin of Bouillon entered Edessa to cheering crowds of Armenians. Tauros made the best of things. He probably saw the writing on the wall, too. His last resort was to adopt Baldwin as his own, as a means of gaining his protection in an indirect way and making it appear as if his own actions on behalf of the people were designed to bring them protection. Tauros went so far as to engage in a strange ritual where both men stripped to the waist and embraced with the same shirt covering them both down in the river. It was intended to represent the adoption of Baldwin by the leader Tauros. Now Duke Baldwin set out on his next military campaign against Baldrek of Samosato to the northwest of Edessa. He occupied the area around Samosato and eventually overthrew it. 
Meanwhile, Tauros was assassinated, leaving Baldwin the new ruler and Count of Edessa. He rode back into Edessa after his most recent victory against hostile neighbors as its new and widely popular welcome change agent. It is hard to believe he knew nothing of the planning and execution of the assassination. Muslim sources make it a certainty, whereas Christian sources paint him as more aloof to the plot regarding Tauros. Either way, Baldwin was meeting the will of the people, and they loved him because he had the ability to protect them. He reopened their confidence to trade and used the Mesopotamian resources to benefit the people of Edessa, as well as the Crusaders. Baldwin made Edessa strong and even remarried an Armenian woman, adopting much of their Christian cultural heritage, which was much different than that in Western Europe. Baldwin was well able to continue holding off any attack from Turkish neighbors and thrived in his strong new county along the Euphrates River. That same month, the Turks that had moved on Robert and Bohemond had not returned after their encounter which boosted morale even though the men were still starving, cold, short on supplies, and without a plan. Then, as if Providence was on their side, with spring came ships from England, containing myriad supplies. Ships first appeared off the coast of St. George's Arm, or known also as the Hellespont, to replenish the Crusaders. Around the same time, a large bounty of gifts, including weapons and horses, from Edessa, where Godfrey's brother Baldwin was now Count, arrived. These were welcome changes that boosted moods and filled bellies. Yet still, Antioch stood in front of them, impregnable. Again it would be Bohemond who finally moved to break the deadlock. He exercised another skill that worked to his advantage. He spoke Greek, a language known to the tower guards at Antioch. With that skill, he struck up a relationship with an Armenian convert to Islam named Feruz, who nursed a grudge toward Antioch's ruler, Yagi Sihand. Feruz agreed to betray several of his towers to Bohemond. Together, they devised a plan. Meanwhile, word came of a large Turkish force under Kerboga coming to face the Crusaders and clear them away from Antioch. Fear spread throughout the Crusader camp. Would they ever take Antioch? They had made it through the winter with men dying every day from starvation and exposure, only to be backed up against the very walls they were desperate to take now. Stephen II, Count of Blois, lowered morale even more when he packed up his men, left the siege, and headed home for France. As pressure mounted for a solution, Bohemond kept his alliance with Ferruz a secret and nursed the relationship as well as flaming the resentment Ferruz had towards Sihant. During the next council of war, Bohemond's political acumen was on full display as he schemed to place himself at the head of the crusade leaders, promising that if he was placed in charge of the city once inside, he would get them in, break the deadlock, and would do it immediately. Count Raymond of Toulouse, who was now bound by oaths to Alexios and Pope Urban II, raised objections immediately. He was keen to remind everyone else of their oaths, too. Luckily, Adamar of Lepuy had the ability to keep the men at least civil in their disagreements, particularly between the fiery Norman Bohemond and Count Raymond. On the other hand, Bohemond had proved himself in battle and had the trust of the Crusaders. Of all the leaders, it had been Bohemond who kept them out of the scrapes, kept morale high, and most of all, won battles. Moreover, the Greek contingent sent by Kimnenis, as Bohemond reminded, had abandoned them. The Council of Lords outvoted the well-meaning and virtuous Raymond, and everyone agreed to Bohemond's plan, whether firmly or tacitly. Bohemond went into action immediately. Next, he set up the whole Crusader army in a great ruse. Much of the army marched away from the walls of Antioch in plain view of the city towers. Bohemond conspired with Firuz to set up the invasion for that same night, and under cover of darkness, the Crusaders snuck back toward the city and hid at the base of the walls and towers, while a particularly large contingent took cover near the front gate. 
With the help of their turncoat, Farouz, Bohemond and his troops snuck into several towers, killing all they encountered with stealth. For this to work, for the element of surprise not to run out on them, they had to be quick and silent. From inside, Bohemond directed the carnage. He sent detachments of knights to kill Turkish guards throughout the rest of the city, clearing first the towers and gateways so the crusaders could enter. At the blast of a trumpet, the all-out attack sounded. Godfrey of Bouillon and Robert of Flanders sacked the city through the front gate, riling the Christian and Greek inhabitants into frenzy as they picked up anything they could and began attacking their oppressors along with the crusaders. Pandemonium overtook Antioch that night. Yagi Sien received confused reports that the citadel in Antioch had fallen. With a detachment of several dozen men, he escaped under a back wall and headed for the desert. Greek and Armenian citizens took out years of resentments on their Turkish oppressors, beating them to death with whatever they could find. The Turks, lacking leadership and realizing their failed position, headed for the one place that was still defensible the citadel that Sihan had been told had fallen. In fact, by the morning of June 4th, 1098, only the citadel at the top of the hill remained under Turkish rule. A detachment of crusaders fearing that Sihan would reach safety and report on their activity tracked him down. When they approached, According to Muslim chroniclers, he was beside himself with embarrassment and shame for having left his post. It was very important for an Islamic leader to look brave and face the enemy no matter the circumstances. It would not look good for one to run from their post. Such an act would be considered not only cowardice, but would carry religious implications of having offended Allah. Certainly, in order to protect his reputation in the eyes of Islamic history, Siand was said to have found forgiveness and restored his wit by the time the Crusaders arrived. They beheaded Yagi and returned to Antioch with his head on a spike, which they placed in direct line of sight to the citadel, still in Turkish hands. Now the Christians were on the inside, but Kerbaga was still coming. Thank you for listening, and I look forward to talking to you next time when we find out how our crusaders inside the city of Antioch fared, and finally, the first crusade sets its sights toward the city of Jerusalem. Talk to you next time. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share. Find me on Facebook and follow me on Twitter. Talk to you next time.